Okay, so uh, last time that we met, we did some stuff in chapter two, learning about engineers, who they are, what kind of engineering things there are out there. Um, and I think, we, what did we cover? We covered civil engineering, biomedical, uh, electrical, what else did we cover? Mechanical. Nature. I'm sorry? Nature. Oh, yeah, conservation engineering, right? And environmental. Environmental engineering, right? Environmental. Um, and on the schedule here, it shows that we're supposed to move on to 210 through 212. But um, I think I want to do some more on, I think I want to watch a couple more videos about different kinds of engineering, just because there's some good ones out there. I want you to get a little more exposure to different types of engineering, but I also want to watch some stuff about um, education in engineering and what it takes to become an engineer educationally. So let's go back to our YouTube world. I also want to cover a couple of the engineering disciplines that are most popular in this area. I've, I've taught quite a few engineers, and, uh, and so I want to look at some of the ones that my students have gone on to to study. Let's take a look at YouTube here. And let's go find our NSF channel. We'll just actually just type in. So um, let's do, let's actually look at, let's see if they have an architectural one. That's one that's pretty popular. Architectural, how do you spell that? Architectural engineering. There we go. Let's see if we can find one on architectural engineering. I haven't actually seen one myself on architectural engineering. It looks like there's a couple of different ones by different universities. Um, one in Australia, that'll just be a great one to listen to for the accent. Let's go to University of Newca Newcastle, Newcastle, Australia. I always love photography. I love to take pictures. I love the experience. Uh, I love the way that people try to find, to find a way of impacting on, on a person by changing the light, changing the position. Uh, and in some sense, what we do in computer science has a lot in common because what we like to do is to change how we solve problems. Computer science is all about solving problems. It's about getting an input for for a given problem and trying to get this the best, like the best conditions. My research is committed to use methods of computer oh. science and apply mathematics. This is computer science. I don't want computer science. Did I push the wrong button? And now that one's not even there. That's weird. Okay, so let's, I must have been seeing something goofy on my screen. Let's go look at uh, Stanford Architectural Design. Let's do what is... Uh, this looks like they're a little too long for us. Let's look at this one. This is Victoria University in Melbourne, Australia. Architectural engineering is the design of modern building systems. These are the systems that support the architecture of a building and provide us with a safe and comfortable place to live and work within. Architectural engineering at Victoria University allows students to focus on either the environmental building services systems or the structural systems that a building needs. Environmental and life safety building systems include things such as air conditioning, lighting, electrical power distribution, uh, hot and cold water distribution, waste removal, and communication systems. Structural systems are the systems that enable the building to stand up, support its loads, and resist things such as winds and earthquakes. The course started at Victoria University in 2001. It's the first course in Australia to be fully accredited by Engineers Australia, and in Victoria it's the only course in architectural engineering. Course graduates are now sought after by industry, especially those that focus on the environmental and life safety building services systems. 
We even have in the third and fourth years of the course industry professionals who come in and teach the students exactly what it is they need to know when they graduate and begin work in industry. Students in architectural engineering are encouraged to go overseas and spend a semester in an architectural engineering program in either the United States, Europe or the United Kingdom. This ensures that the course remains relevant by being matched against international programs of architectural engineering. Okay, so simply put, architectural engineering is all about the engineering that goes into a building. And you notice that he split it into two parts. There is essentially the building itself, how do you hold the thing up, how do you keep it from falling down, support all that stuff, and then the inner workings, the guts of the building, the electrical systems, the waste systems, the water systems, the environmental systems, the communication systems, all of those things are designed by engineers, okay? And it's actually a huge thing in Nebraska because we have, at UNL, in the School of Engineering, um, we have a, it's actually at UNO, it's actually in, in Omaha, but it's still the same School of Engineering. We have the Peter Kimmett Institute, which is uh, a huge building, brand new, all these great programs in it, where this is what they do. This is their, this is their focus. So let's take a look here at, uh, let's look at buildings and campuses, look at the Peter Kimmett Institute. So this is the engineering building at UNL, the uh, Otmer Hall, and uh, they do lots of different kinds of engineering there. And it's, uh, it's been around a long time. They have another one, the Scott Engineering Building, right next to it, essentially. And uh, Nebraska Hall, which is right next to that, I believe. This is the building in U at UNL where they do uh, this kind of engineering, the architectural type of engineering. They also have construction management civil engineering, construction engineering, um, things like this, mechanical engineering, industrial management systems engineering. The industrial management systems engineering is where you have a lot of that internal buildings kind of engineering, the, the water systems and electrical systems and things like that. Um, then this is the Shore Center, which is over by the stadium. Avery Hall, which is where computer science and computer engineering is at. Chase Hall, uh, I know it's in there. Uh, biomedical. Oh, this is over on the this is over on the eastern campus of uh, of UNL, which is completely different than the normal campus of UNL. It's kind of further uh, towards the down, further towards the uh, eastern part of the city, and uh, further north as well in the city. And they do all their biological and agricultural engineering on that on that campus, completely different campus. Then on the Omaha campus, you have this new building, the Peter Kewitt Institute where they do a lot of the stuff that is involved with um, architectural engineering and systems engineering. Um, and they do, they have a lot of, a lot of space there, a lot of, uh, a lot of great money going into the school as well. Uh, so that's, they have the Charles Durham School of Architectural Engineering and Construction. They have tons of laboratories there where you're doing this stuff for real, where you get to build electrical systems, you get to build uh, water systems, and you get to test them, you get to see them working, you see them in action. Lots of, uh, lots of CAD systems, computer-aided drafting and things like this, computer-aided design. Um, just a great building. I've been out there a couple of times, I think, maybe two or three times. Um, huge, great stuff, all brand new. And if you want to see, you know, this kind of engineering, if you're interested in this kind of engineering, you want to see a building that does this well. Right here in this state, you've got this great resource and a great place to go to school. I know that most people think UNL when they think going to school in the state. But um, as far as architectural engineering goes, and systems engineering, I would say probably that Omaha has the upper hand, especially with this, with this institute that they've built um, recently. So that's a great, a great opportunity uh, for students it's also, I mean, UNO is in a beautiful part of Omaha. It's a great place uh, to be, a great place to live. Uh, so it's uh, not a bad place for students. Uh, so that is uh, architectural engineering. Let's look at um, one that I know a student in this class has an interest in. And that every engineer should really be thinking of. 
it turns out that power engineering is a very new field. Why? Well, because before this new generation of our new generation of engineers, most of the people that have run power plants have been people that went into the power plant industry as technicians. They went in as plumbers, electricians, um, systems technicians of some kind, and then they learned the systems on the job and became the managers of the power plants. And many of them don't have engineering degrees, but they're just as smart or smarter than any engineer that has ever worked in a power plant because they learned it on the job. These people have been on their jobs for 30 years. Guess what? It's time for retirement. They're getting ready to leave. Some of them have been in the job for 40, almost 50 years because they started while they were in their 20s, uh, just as a plumber or something in the, in the power plant. Not plumbing toilets, they were plumbing the water systems of the power plant because there's water systems in the power plant. Uh, but these guys are all retiring now and we need people who can run these systems, but unfortunately we can't bring them in as plumbers. We need people that understand the systems right now. They've got, to people, they've got to be people that understand mathematics, they've got to be people that understand computers, that understand complex systems and how they run, and they've got to be able to manage those systems. They're not going to actually be out there turning the wrenches all the time, but they're going to be in the control center, which is a very high-tech modern place these days. It looks kind of like a space station center these days. It's got so many computer screens. Uh, but we need people in, in these power plants in the next few years to take over these, these management positions. There are just not enough people to do it. And so they're hiring all kinds of people to come into these positions. They're hiring mechanical engineers and civil engineers, anybody with an engineering background who can come in and manage these systems. And schools are now putting in system, putting in programs that are about power engineering so that we can educate people specifically to uh, run these things. So let's take a look at this one right here. This one looks like a good one. This is a Canadian one, it looks like. My name's Bill Shaw. I'm a uh, power engineer here at Lampton College. The equipment in our, 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 our boiler room here is a, it's a 143 horse uh, water tube boiler. It's a training boiler. It runs an automatic. We give our students all the safety procedures that go along with adding the chemicals that they need to, to make proper boiler feed water, understanding how we generate steam, uh, how, the heat is, how the heat is interjected into the steam, um, how we can use it a, as a, a, a power source for... Okay, so I'm just going to stop this just for a second. This guy is teaching at a college and he's got a miniature power plant here. So, uh, Kyle, can you tell us the size of the boiler out of Sutherland Power Plant? Is it something you could walk up to and stand next to and say, this is our boiler? The control panel might be, but the boiler itself... Yeah, the control panel is the size bigger. of a human, but the boiler is the size of a six-story building, right? Yeah. Um, well, maybe not quite that big, but the boiler is probably the size of a, of a, of a large truck um, and sits on top of a furnace that is the size of a six-story building. It is a monster. The boiler is almost the entire length of the of the uh, the furnace as well. It's just not obvious. It's in the sides, the side walls of the, of the furnace. But the boiler is humongous. Here they're talking about a boiler that's six feet tall and they're making steam within their internal generators. But this is a great idea. In a college, you have a miniature boiler, a miniature steam generator, a miniature turbine, and you have a miniature power plant. So you can learn all the systems in one room whereas the systems in a power plant take up, you know, five large buildings, very large buildings. So... All kinds of things from steam turbines to, to heating systems in, in plants to building heating to sterilizing uh, in, in hospitals. So, so steam has a lot of uses. So our engineers become uh, the jack of all trades, master of none. We have to know a lot about a lot of sciences. We have to know a bit about welding, a bit about construction, a bit about water treatment, a bit about chemistry, so that we can call the expert in if we have trouble. But while we're here, we have to know a bit about all those things, so the, the subjects that we study are very wide range. So when you arrive at work, there's someone that's been doing your job overnight. So you have what you call a relief, a handoff. You spend time with that person conversing about what happened during the night, which is something that I need to know. And so this is a very important part of power production and power engineering, and that is that it's a team effort. Power plants do not stop running 
even if they do, they still have a staff that, man that manages and monitors things. Uh, for example, there is a power plant in Beatrice here in Nebraska that does shut down. It only runs in the summer during the high irrigation season. But even when they're not running, they have an engineering staff and a maintenance staff that is working on things, fixing things up, testing things, making sure that it's ready to go when it comes on. But they're also in charge of power throughput because they actually have power that comes through their power station that goes somewhere else. And so they're monitoring what other power stations are doing. And so it's, uh, it's a huge collaborative effort, not only with the people that you're working with at your power plant, but with people at every other power plant in your system. And sometimes even power plants on a national level. They all have to coordinate, they all have to talk to each other, communicate with each other, so they know what's going on um, in the system in general. And if there's something went wrong maintenance-wise that you have to get prepared or whatever for when, when you start to work. So after that's done, you head to your locker and you get all your, your coveralls, your boots, all your safety equipment on. And you normally meet your team in the lunchroom uh, along with your shift supervisor or the, the chief engineer or the shift engineer in that case. They'll talk about, uh, we'll have a little safety meeting to talk about anything that might be happening that day, any maintenance that might be going on that day that you might have to prepare a pump for or you've got to leak someplace that you have to watch out for or, or anything unusual that would happen. After that, you, you would have what they call readings and you would go to the area where you are with, with a sheet or, or uh, some, uh, uh, you know, like an optical pyrometer such as this, and, and you would shoot the temperature of things and you would record those because that helps you to understand how the equipment is running. And, and so you do those on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, so that would take, you know, about an hour while you do all your routes. So again, something else important in a lot of engineering jobs. Probably the majority of engineers who leave college with an engineering degree of some kind are in this business of making sure that things are going to work. And that means you're doing a lot of measuring, a lot of recording, a lot of testing, a lot of maintenance, um, or you're at least ordering maintenance. You may not be the one doing the maintenance, but you're at least making sure that it's getting done, you're scheduling it, making sure the person that's in charge of actually doing that work is coming and getting it done. Very details oriented. And so a lot of engineers who go into these positions are, are the type of person that is very details oriented, that keeps, thing, keeps their ducks in a row, has a very organized mind, a very organized life. Because that's very important in our, in our society is to, have, is to have things that are very orderly, very well maintained, and very uh, predictable. That's exactly what he's talking about here. So this is one of those jobs that is very much that way. A process operator's job or a power engineer's job is a bit like a fireman's job. You have to know how to do the right things in the first five minutes because if you make a mess of that first five minutes, it could take you five hours, five days, or five weeks to recover from that. So part of what we do as far as training here is teaching people to do the right thing in the first five minutes. Training. And, and that's what part of the power engineering training is and how they can wreck. So training and education is a continual part of most engineers' lives. Okay, I love this video. I've never seen it before, before today. But this video is talking about some of the keys of all engineering fields. Right? Maintenance, testing, recording, uh, training. These things happen every day in almost every engineer's life. And it's something that, uh, something that if you're not comfortable with, you need to understand that it's going to be a part of your life. So either you need to get comfortable with it or maybe not be an engineer. Um, so. Nice. You see a pressure gauge going up, but there's an alarm coming in. Power engineering is not for everyone. Um, you have to have excellent, strong mathematics, chemistry, physics, thermodynamic skills. You have to have a willingness to work hard and work well in teams. You have to have excellent communication skills. And I would say that those, that statement is also true across all of the engineering disciplines. Um, a lot of times engineers are, sh are, are perceived to be, shown to be, assumed to be people that are not very sociable because they're so nerdy. People that are not work, don't work well with other people because they're so nerdy. <laughs> in, in truth, engineers are usually not very much that way. There are some engineering fields that really have a lot of engineers that are like that. Computer engineers, software engineers have a tendency to be that way in many cases. Not always, but they kind of have that persona because they spend so much time with their computer. 
Um, but engineers in general, even most software and computer engineers, do end up working with a lot of other people and not just other engineers. We're talking about uh, marketers, businessmen, uh, politicians, regular people on the street. They often have to work with all kinds of people because their products reach so many different people um, in so many different ways. And so that teamwork component, that working with people component, um, the talking with people component, the communications component, it's always there in engineering. And many times you will meet people that you think couldn't possibly be engineers who are engineers because they are so normal. They have this normal persona. They might even be interesting socially um, because they have to be. It's, that's the kind of person that thrives in the engineering environment. I really like that video. It's a good one. Let's see. So um, let's look at another one that's kind of interesting. We actually have two nuclear, um, two nuclear power plants in this state. One in Brownsville, which is south of Lincoln, and one that is in Omaha. And uh, it turns out that uh, there is a major for nuclear engineering. Let's take a look at this one. Oops. Tremendous energy is trapped in the nucleus of a tiny atom. Harnessing that energy is the work of nuclear engineers. They search for efficient ways to capture the bursts of energy from a disintegrating atom and put it to use. Nuclear engineers can be found developing numerous applications for nuclear energy, including power plants for consumer heat and electricity, methods for the diagnosis and treatment of diseases, preservation of food supplies, or sterilization of medical instruments, and systems to power ships and spacecraft. Nuclear engineers also make sure the atom's awesome power is used with care and that nuclear waste is disposed of safely. The ingredients for success in nuclear engineering... I'm going to stop that right there because the last one that they mentioned is probably the most, the most uh, concerning one, the most, one that most people have concern with um, and that we should have a lot of concern with. The United States the government, the, our federal government, the White House in particular, has essentially just signed a, some kind of act, law, something not an act really since it wasn't Congress, it was the White House, they essentially signed a law that said uh, that we can now store nuclear waste in parking lots. Yeah, it sounds weird, right? Well, the reason is because six years ago when the White House, the White House made a statement that they were going to close the nuclear waste site in Nevada, which is where all of our nuclear waste was supposed to go. They'd spent decades um, researching this place in, in Nevada, in the desert of Nevada, it's in the middle of nowhere, literally, has the best rock and the best situation, the best weather and everything for storing nuclear waste in the entire world. No better place for it. But politics, unfortunately, um, made us close that site down. And it was pure politics because one of our most powerful senators in our Senate comes from Nevada. And he just, he never wanted it in his state. And when he finally got a president that in, in the White House that uh, was, uh, would listen to him, he decided to, to move on that power and stop the project. So we have no place to store our nuclear waste in this country. And we have just signed an act saying that nuclear power plants can now build little concrete bunkers in their parking lots and store the nuclear waste there. Not a good idea, in my opinion. Um, some people might think, well, it's dangerous because people can steal it, use, weapon, use it for weapons. No, that's not really the problem. The problem is, is if we start, if we start uh, we start storing high-level nuclear waste just anywhere, what, what's next? Are we going to start saying, well, we can just start dumping in the ocean? We're going to start dumping in rivers. I mean, we're just essentially going downhill. We're, we're moving backwards. Instead of having a safe place where we can store it and control it and make sure that it's, you know, we, we can monitor it, we're now storing it in a thousand different places where there's not going to be a standard of control or measurement because you can't you can't do that. You can't standardize and control something in a thousand different places. It just doesn't happen. And so we're going to have an issue. And the only way we're going to we're going to even have any amount of control on that issue is to have more people who are educated in nuclear science or nuclear engineering in particular 
so that we can have a better idea, better ideas, and better places, better ways to store in the future. And in the meantime, we can have people monitoring this stuff and storing it properly uh, so that we don't have any problems while we're waiting for a new solution. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that politics has once again uh, trumped science and trumped engineering and made a major problem for the future. But, you know, that's what we get. We, we are the ones who elect our, our, uh, our national government. We're the ones who elect Congress. We elect Senate. We elect our president. And we get what we elect. We have elected people who don't know what they're talking about. We have elected ignoramuses, unfortunately. And that's not new. We've not elected somebody who knows anything about science for many, many years. And unfortunately now we have elected somebody who doesn't know anything about science and doesn't listen to anybody who knows anything about science. And so we've got a double problem right now. But in the meantime, it means we'll have probably a lot of jobs for nuclear engineers as we try to clean up this mess that we're about to make for the next 20 years probably. So uh, uh, I know you engineers that are starting your engineering, you can, you can be grateful, I guess, that you're going to have lots of jobs doing nuclear engineering um, for the foreseeable future until we change that. Engineering includes strong aptitudes in physics, chemistry, <laughs> biology, and mathematics, as well as technical writing and computer programming. A creative approach to problem solving and a college degree in one of the engineering sciences is also needed. Since nuclear power is used in aircraft carriers and submarines, naval experience is also a path to this career. The majority of new So that's one of the reasons I brought this one up. I get a lot of students who either have had um, experience in the military or, or thinking about going into the military and this is a great opportunity because if you have some college experience or a college degree you know, in sciences in particular you can actually sign up to go into the military as a high-grade officer studying nuclear physics nuclear engineering actually um, usually in, in most cases you're going to go into the uh, you're going to go in, uh, go into the Navy, and you're going to work probably on an aircraft carrier or a cruiser or a submarine, which is nuclear powered. So we have not just aircraft carriers that are powered, um, but also submarines and cruisers. Cruisers are essentially transport ships, um, large transport ships. But anyway, uh, you have these you have uh, these ships that are completely powered by nuclear power plants. All their electricity comes from the nuclear power plant. All their propulsion comes from the nuclear power plant. All their heating comes from the nuclear power plant. All their water comes from the nuclear power plant. They use their electricity from the power plant to make fresh water as well. And so, um, and on the submarine, actually, their oxygen comes from the nuclear power plant as well. The, the oxygen that they breathe is actually created by the electricity from the nuclear power plant. In addition to that, we also have nuclear weapons, but most of those um, they do require nuclear engineers mostly to maintain, to do the maintenance on them and things like this, um, and, some, and also some of the fabrication even. Um, but a lot of that is actually done by private contractors and by, um, by nuclear scientists rather than nuclear engineers, which is a very different kind of deal. Um, most of them are uh, people that have PhDs in nuclear science or something else like that. But another field where you can go to the military, there are many other fields where you can go to the military for training that will give you kind of a head, uh, kind of a leg up. Because when you get your training from the military, not only is it free, but they're paying you at the same time. It's not a great pay, but you're getting paid. And you get lots and lots of on-the-job on experience, tons of it, right? It's a very, pretty different experience than most people get, but it is on-the-job experience. You'll get to, you'll probably get to uh, travel the world and do this in many different places. Um, the downside, of course, is that you have to dedicate six years of your life. Four years active duty, two years usually as reserve. If you go into the nuclear fields, it's usually a little bit different. Usually um, um, your, act, your, your active duty is four years, but usually that's um, taken up in large part by education and training. So you'll spend probably two to three years in education and training, essentially getting an uh, engineering degree. And then you'll go on to um, a couple of years of active duty and a couple of years of, um, and in fact, I think you actually have more years of, of uh, 
reserve, I think you, you end up with four years of reserve instead of two because they give you so much education that they figure they can steal that from you, steal that time from you. But it is a great opportunity. They have electrical engineering in every, in every branch of the military. Um, they use electrical engineering. They use civil engineering in just about every branch of the military. They use mechanical engineering in all, just about all branches of the military. Um, but it's, but it, in particular, nuclear engineering is mostly in the Navy. Um, if you have trouble with seasickness or staying in a small spot for a long period of time, probably shouldn't go into the Navy for nuclear engineering because you're very likely to end up on a submarine. Clear engineer. Or, or a boat that it just doesn't have very much space. You know, even aircraft carriers have a limited amount of space. You know, most of that space is taken up by systems and, and airplanes. So, anyway. It's work for public utilities or engineering <laughs> consulting <laughs> firms. <laughs> Nuclear engineers have to be very responsible people who take great pride and great care in the work that they do. So nuclear engineering, very, uh, very similar to power engineering because it is related to power plants in many ways, uh, but a very different background in the, the underlying knowledge. Nuclear engineers generally have about twice as much time in their education, uh, whereas power engineers can spend probably five or six years in their education. Nuclear engineers are generally spending 10 years in their education. Um, so it takes a bit more time just because there's so much more uh, background information there. But again, another uh, another field of engineering that's quite uh, quite a common one these days. Here, this one's an interesting video. I've seen this one before because this one actually shows you the military side of things. So I'm going to play this one really quick. Well, I guess in high school physics, I got the bug. Um, kind of got really excited about solving problems, really geeky stuff like that. Actually, my physics teacher wanted me to be a physicist, but I thought, you know, solving problems was really more interesting. And so I decided to go to MIT. As part of being in the Navy, I've gotten my master's degree in mechanical engineering and got sent off to naval reactors. It actually all started after World War II uh, when Congress decided that it was the right time to actually harness the atom for nuclear propulsion. And Admiral Rickover, who started the entire program, basically put together the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. So it's essentially a college. Actually, Naval Reactors is um, a very small headquarters. We're only about 200 to 250 engineers at headquarters. And we have ultimate control, ultimate um, management over all of the facilities. Naval Reactors is not only the design entity, but also the regulator. So we self-regulate which is a very important part of what we do. Uh, and we take that very seriously. And one aspect of that is going out to ships to ensure that the crew is ready to operate the reactor in a safe manner. And you're asking really tough questions. And what's really amazing is that they know the answers. Uh, today we're at the USS Nimitz, which is one of the 10 aircraft carriers that the United States Navy has. So this is a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Actually, I'm really excited because today uh, it was one of those great opportunities for us to get out of the office and actually see the ship and we get to come and ask some questions, um, make sure the crew's ready to operate the, the ship safely. Well, how do you think the drill team performed in monitoring the evolution? Well, when I saw it, and I wasn't done in the plant, of course, but from what we saw in the locker, I thought they did a pretty good job. Working at Naval Reactors is kind of like having a civilian job. Um, I live at home. I go to work in civilian clothes. I come home at night. I don't deploy. That was established, actually, back by Rickover, and the intent was that he didn't want the decisions that we made to be based on our rank. He wanted all the decisions that were made at headquarters to be technically based. We've got a very flat. So this is a, a, a fine example, actually, of government getting something right. Okay, Admiral Rickover, back in the 50s, uh, he developed this program in the Navy, which was technically based, scientifically based, and not determined by 
some some general summer who wanted something done, or some admiral summer, I guess, in the Navy, who wanted something done a specific way, or you know, some some president says, I want to change this all. No, it's not that way. This is important enough and dangerous enough, quite honestly, that it needed to be controlled by the people who understood it. And that was that is written right into the right into the program. It cannot be changed. Um, so they're a, they're an independent entity that behaves very much like a company that is in charge of the Navy's nuclear reactors. It looks like they own every nuclear reactor and they decide who runs them, how they run them, if they're running them correctly, if they need to be replaced, if they need to be serviced. They decide all of this. They, have, they are the entity that, that is in charge of all of that. Of course, there are the people on the individual boats that are enlisted men and officers that do a very similar thing, but only on that boat. These people run the whole system. And, it's a, and obviously, from her opinions, it's a great place to work. She doesn't deploy. She doesn't. She does not endanger, you know, having to go off to war at some point because her job is not to go to war. It's to make sure that those boats that do go to war can go to war, right? And there are similar, similar organizations in other branches of the military where their job is not to be the army. Their job is to make sure the army functions properly from a technical standpoint. Okay, so there are electrical engineers that do similar jobs for the Army because the Army, all of their equipment is electronic these days. Even their new rifles these days are more electronic than they are mechanical. Okay, so uh, they've got all kinds of things going on that are in, in, in the military that are, yeah, it's a military organization, but it's not really military. It's more technical, more of an engineering thing. Very important. Flexible schedule. Instead of taking lunch, we'll actually go work out. So you've been working on a tough problem all morning, and you just take a break and you say, I'm going to go for a run. Clears the cobwebs. I, I think about new engineering challenges, how to how to solve something, get into a groove, start thinking about the problem, and sure enough, by the time you get back, you know, you've got the solution. But I think there's kind of a duality to what we do that um, kind of gives you that holistic appreciation for what the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program is. We not only are supporting the existing fleet, but we're also looking to the future. I mean, we've been designing ships for over 60 years, you know, the over 136 million miles steamed, and the safety record is just, is just outstanding. So it's all... So here they're talking about all the things that they do presently in the Navy, but also in the future in the Navy. They're designing new things, they're overseeing the design of new things, which means that they're working with companies. They just showed a whole bunch of ships that were made by about six or seven different companies. Um, you have TRW, you have Electric Boat Company, you have, uh, you have uh, Ball, I think it's Ball or Bell, I can't remember. I mean, just all, all these companies that work for the Navy, or work to design things and build things for the Navy. And so once you're done, in your, with your active service, you actually have this great resume to go to this company that you've been working with for 10 years, right? And not only that, but you go to this company and they'll pay you 10 times what they paid you at the Army, at the, at the Navy, right? And that's uh, similar to what happened to my grandfather. My grandfather was a civil engineer for the, um, civil engineer for the Army for many years. And when he decided to leave the Army and retire, um, he turned right around and was hired as an independent contractor for the for the Air Force, essentially. So he worked for himself, but he got all of his pay from the, from the Air Force. Uh, he got paid ten times what he was getting paid for what he was getting paid by the Army, and uh, did the same work. He was doing the same exact kind of work. He was just doing it on his own paycheck, you know, doing it for himself. Um, and he could have just as easily gone and worked for a company that uh, that did work for the Army or for anybody else, because he had all this experience all this education, a master's degree in civil engineering. Um, it's a great opportunity to go and work, uh, to go and work in the, the armed services in an engineering capacity. The, the point, the, the keys to it though, is that you have to have your education well underway before you go into it, or you need to have good enough test scores, good enough high school grades, so that you can get into one of the academies. You want to get into the Army Academy, the Army, uh, what are they called? 
West Point. West Point, thank you. You have to get into West Point as an engineer. Get into their engineering program at West Point. You have to get into the Air Force Academy. You have to get into the Naval Academy. And that covers all three of them, right? Because there's only three, because Marines go to the Naval Academy as well. Uh, but all of those services are looking for engineers all the time. Uh, right now, what's the hot thing in, 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 the, in the military? The hottest thing in the military is drones right now, right? Every one of those drones is designed, built, maintained, controlled, flown, uh, fixed, everything else by engineers. These things, aren't even, these things aren't even done by technicians yet because they're so new. We've been using them for quite a while, but they're, they're so rapidly improving so much that every time we set up a drone, it's like a new version. Um, but they're so new that really we don't even have technicians that are really capable of doing everything that needs to be done on them. And so engineers have a very hands-on job there. And also the ones that are controlling these things, because most of them aren't technically drones. Most of them are just remote controlled vehicles. Um, they're mostly UAVs, which is unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, but they're being controlled remotely. And most of that controlling is being done by the engineers, not by some pilot and not by some, uh, some people think that it's, you know, these, these uh, brilliant kids that they get off of video game machines. They have, no, it's not. It's engineers. Besides, engineers are usually brilliant video game players anyway. So anyway, the point is, is that uh, there are great opportunities in the military right now. And if you have an interest in that, you should really look into it. There are just great opportunities. And while you're in college, you can do ROTC and you can get paid to go to college. I have a few students that have done that as well. It's been a good experience for them. Or you can be in the reserve. Same kind of thing. So anyway, um, lots and lots of different careers out there. We've shown some specific ones today that I think are great opportunities for us here in Nebraska and some of the ones that my students are more interested in. Um, if you have any questions about these, feel free to come and talk to me or to send me an email call me on the phone, set up an appointment, we can get together somehow. And I'd be happy to go through um, the opportunities, some of the opportunities in more detail with you and kind of point you in the right direction as far as what you need to do right now to get uh, yourself appointed in, in a good position for these. And uh, I can even, I'm even uh, willing to uh, start setting you up with opportunities to do work study um, and uh, internships we do have contacts. In fact, uh, Kyle is already working for an MPPD, right? Kind of, kind of work. He's working at a power plant, right? I'll figure it out. That's fine. Um, you want, where, whatever your connection is, it doesn't matter what you do at the power plant. Really, it's it's the it's the um, the interaction at first, because really a true internship doesn't happen until you have some more education under your belt. So you're probably at least a sophomore or a junior in the engineering program. So you get through these first introductory courses, you start to learn more about engineering, and then you go to these people and say, hey, look, I want, I want to come here and work for you. And they say, well, you'll be sweeping floors and you know cleaning parts at first. And they say, that's fine. I don't care what I'm doing. I just want to have the experience of being around the people that do this stuff, because that's, that's just extremely valuable experience. So uh, come and talk to me, send me an email, and I'll be happy to, to share what I can share with you and to help you help get your point in the right direction. That's all for today. Um, remember that you do still have homework in Chapter 2. We're going to finish up Chapter 2 on, what's today, Wednesday? Finish up on Friday. Um, we're a little bit behind the schedule that's in the syllabus, but that's fine because we're going to push things a little further down the road. Um, finally, I think we finally have got that package mailed off. Um, for um, Wade, right? Wade out in uh, Sergeant. So hopefully that package will be coming to you. Uh, it took forever to get that through the system. But you'll have some parts so that we can start a project next week and, uh, and we'll get excited for that. That'll be fun. Have a good one. We're done. <laughs>